This is why when you go to a church, you want to ask them off the jump, not just whether or not you like the preaching or whether or not you like the environment or if your kids are well cared for. All of those things I understand are important. What you want to ask for is, can I see the statement of faith of the house? Can I see what you adhere to? And make sure that those are orthodox. What do we say, fam? Welcome to Simplexity. A little podcast where we take seemingly complex matters and attempt to make them plain and simple. My name is Sammy Foster with my very cherished co-host, Boots. Hello there. Hello, friend. Good to see you. You know what this marks? This marks, uh, you know this. I do. But for our viewers and listeners, they may know this it's but it's my this... birthday <laughs> what just, just kidding it's not when is your birthday june 8th oh that's right that's right we did the uh the live recording around the time that's when exact. was that last june 9th or something that or was the at 11th? the end of season number <laughs> trace it's tough to keep track of these seasons it sure is at some point we're gonna be like thanks for tuning in to season 37 <laughs> it's like they haven't been canceled yet yeah, right? We're working on it. Sorry, you were saying, though, this marks the what? The end of season number six. Yes. Episode 10, season number six. That's 60 episodes, 60 different topics. Actually, you could add a few to them mm-hmm. for ones that uh, they're, uh, they have not been released due to quality. <laughs> not necessarily content, <laughs> but... Uh, Remember way back then? I do. It, I was just thinking about that actually. Like, I will. I refuse to go back and listen to season one, season two, because it's just like I was talking to my uh, future brother-in-law. I was like, there, the cringe level. I can't handle that. It's it's <laughs> it's hard enough to listen to yourself, but to yeah. listen to your. Do you ever experience that with like sermons from? Oh, oh, I could never. No. no, not 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 old ones. I have a hard time listening to myself. Um, although although I do listen to myself, um, like if if I think about a point that I'm making or had made, mm. and I want to think through how did I make that point. Yeah. So I will, in in this era of my preaching, I'm more comfortable of listening to myself. Whereas I can't, I can't rewind the, the tape too much. Yeah. Oh, it just makes my skin crawl. Early 2010s. Yeah, oh my gosh. Back at Langley and there was such a, a youthful zeal, but. You, you sound very different than you did back then. Really? Your voice. Becca, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. In, yeah. in, in what regard? I don't know. In it's what just regard? <laughs> it's like. It's like your voice has gotten deeper. Huh. Um, I just hit puberty. (laughs) (laughs) And also, you used to do this thing. Uh Oh, here we go. We're probably going, we're about to make Beck uncomfortable because we're going too far down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beck hates rabbit trails. But it's it's the end of the season. It's okay. I'm on the struggle bus today, so you can do it. (laughs) But you used to do this thing, and I remember um, it was whenever you were making like a really profound point and you could tell that it was coming from a deep well yeah. within you and you would go, you know, like, let's say you're preaching, you're like, and this thing that we got in you and you just don't, don't <laughs> like it, it sounded almost like, and I just noticed like, he doesn't do that anymore. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank you, no, Jesus. No, no, it com- to me, it communicated deep authenticity and passion. Yeah. But maybe to you, you maybe you heard that and you're like, oh, I can't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. There's not a lot that... Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. I, I can see myself doing that. You know, um, it, there's times that I'll listen to myself and I'll know what I'm getting ready to say. Because, <laughs> because there's such a familiar... It's not necessarily like the cadence. Yeah. It's just... My the way my mind thinks, hmm. and so I know. Oh, this is, this is you're probably going. going to to say this. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've had, you know, young church planners and what have yous, um, what have yous, <laughs> um, you know, ask me about preaching or coaching in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And the, the reality is I'm a terrible coach in that regard because I've never sat under a lot of coaching myself. And what I'm saying is- You just learn through experience. Learn through experience. And I'm, I, I like talking. Um, <laughs> no, how, hold on, hold on. I'm trying to make a point here. <laughs> I like th this sort of organic flow. I get very jammed up when there's mechanics involved and there's systems that need to be applied. Um, I'm not real good with this. This is why my, my preaching, you know, professor in, in Bible college told me, Hey, I think you need to maybe focus on counseling. Really? Oh yeah. He wow. told me this ain't your gig, man. I bet and, he, I bet he feels like a fuddy duddy now. <laughs> hey, I told him so. So just recently we're way off, yeah. but Hey, we're going okay. somewhere. I was asked to be the alum of the year for the school in which I graduated. And his name was uh, Pastor Mike Cavanaugh. And he sat in the front row and I had to sort of give a sermonette mm. in, in the receiving of the Alum of the Year Award. Congratulations, and, by the way. Thank you so much. Well-deserved. Thank you. Um, and it was a high honor. Oh, it was, a, you want to talk about a, a circular thing of me remembering where I was back then. I had just gotten out of Teen Challenge. I'd gone to Elam. Here I am mm -hmm. I'm on fire for Jesus, but I'm cutting my teeth on everything. And so I get there. Never in a million years had God told me back then, one day you're going to come back, you're going to be alum of the year, and you're going to be on the board of mm. this school, mm -hmm. of which now I'm one of the directors. However, I told him that story. I reminded him that he, you know, he pulled me aside after class and said, "Hey, this ain't this ain't your jam." And 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 I I remember when he told me that, I didn't disagree with him. And I meant that authentically. Even to this day I don't fully disagree. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, Pastor Mike, I don't fault you at all. It, this isn't like, look at me now. Yeah. It's, no. it's, it's much more. Look at God. Look at God. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but God. Hey. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah but, that's how to like tell a story <laughs> and make yourself the hero, but cloak it in spirituality. Exactly. I know you're not doing that. I'm just but, saying that's what no, people would I, do. Thank you for noting that. That's the, but I say all that to say. I am not good at the mechanics of <clears throat> preaching, so I always encourage people that want me to either help or assist in, I point them to John. <laughs> yeah. John is a wonderful, wonderful Mechanical. teacher, preacher, yeah, and he's just, he relies on mechanics. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I rely on the anointing, you yeah. know, tomato, yeah. tomato. It's, it's, you know. <laughs> Anywho. Let's get to it. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to get to because actually for our listeners and viewers, this was not determined until this morning. Correct. That's how uncanned we are. We figured we'd really set the bar high for the final episode of the season. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. But really where this sort of formed from, if you will, um, we're post-Easter. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm in a season of where Lighthouse Church is, um, by all accounts, it's growing rapidly. And we seem to be, um, we, we rhythmically sort of go through these seasons here at the church. And so when we go through seasons of growth and a lot of increase and a lot of life change and all, it, it no longer surprises me. It humbles me. It makes me deeply grateful for Jesus still building his church. But it's almost um, somewhat anticipated that God um, does this through certain seasons of our church. And we have constantly and honest and authentic and sincerely I've used all the words there to make oh. this point clear. <laughs> we really do see it as a move of the of the Holy Spirit, and we change very little 
to actually create a catalyst for growth. We keep doing the same thing year in, year out. Um, but yet, but yet, on the same token, what I'll hear is, is that people will come to Lighthouse and Jesus do something all together amazing in their life. And then they'll, they'll, they'll find themselves in a season where they're disgruntled a little bit or they want to leave now. Um, and um, and they, they, they want to find another church and of which we then go, well, let us, let us help. Let us help. Lighthouse Church certainly isn't the only game in town, and we're not f the church for everyone. But yet, because I have such close relationships with so many pastors, we often compare notes as it pertains to people leaving and or coming or what have you. And what I've really realized as of late is that there should be a much more understood criteria when it comes to why you should leave a church mm -hmm. that I don't believe is talked about enough. And I don't believe that people are held accountable to. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It seems like there's a very low threshold for why someone would leave. You know, it's almost like <clears throat> if you have a, a spectrum, yes, if you will, on one end of the spectrum, you have family, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have being part of like, a, let's say a local gym. Well said. And so where on that spectrum of ability to separate from and desire and, you know, need criteria to leave, right? Where does a church fall on that? And I feel like a lot of people find themselves closer to the local gym spectrum where yeah. it's like, well, as long as... You know, as long as it's not too crowded, as long as I can get to the machine that I want. Totally. Um, as long as the, the people treat me however, you know, as long as the music's good. Right. Um, as long as the preacher doesn't go, we thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, but I, I heard a critique, especially coming out of 2020, which was so divisive in a lot of ways. Totally. A lot of people left various churches for various reasons. Um Nathan Finocchio made the point, like, what would it take for you to leave your family? Like, huh. what, what, what would it take for you to, to set the line and say, no, I'm going to fight for my family? Right. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I've seen it ever since. Like, yeah. this church, this is my family. Right. And so unless things get really bad, like, I'm holding tight. Um, I'm going to fight for, for things, obviously, that I believe in. But yep. um, I feel like people don't have that mentality. It's a little bit more consumeristic, totally. a little bit more preference-based, and a little bit more, eh, I can probably go to the different gym. So, so let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, not to in any way refute what you're saying, because I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yet, um, you know, when you say Lighthouse Church, or this church, not this, because this isn't about Lighthouse. It's I'm talking about, about the body. The body. <laughs> I'm talking about the big C church. <laughs> when it, it comes to you saying this is family, um, some may argue, well, it's easy for you to say that because you, you, you have never been part of another church outside of when you went to Liberty and you were, you know, um, you are deeply invested in this church due to the relationships that you have, your brother being on staff, you now being on staff, you know, your, your parents' involvement. Of, you know, you were with Lighthouse when we were 60 people back at June Drive. And so naturally, you have grown up in this church, in same here. Um, and so it's easy for you to say, this is, this is my family. Whereas some people, yeah. when you consider the size of Lighthouse, have never been deeply connected by way of community or relationships or even in the matter of serving, what have you. It's easy for them to say, I'm going to find another church because that's really not my family. Um, of which um, is under, it, it, it's, a, it's a plausible reason that people would have to, to depart. Not saying that it's right because I believe that church should become your family, mm -hmm. but there's reasons why it would not be considering the sheer size or at times um, 
as people have said it, you know, there's, there can be clicks and there could be barriers, yada, yada, yada. Do you understand? Are you sensitive to that? I guess. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I do understand that. And I am. Do you, under, do you understand how much he loves you? Um, that was a very uh, abstract joke. Um, no, I do get that. Counterpoint to that, there have been people who grew up in this very same church who did leave. That, and, and absolutely. they would have called it family for 15, 20 years. Something happened, and then they're like, I'm moving on. Right on. The second thing that I would say is, okay, maybe you are new. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, at some point, you need to determine whether this is family or not. Like, so when you're, well when you're heading into, you know, People like to use the word church shopping, yep. um, which we could have a discussion about totally. in and of itself, I'm sure. But what is your threshold to determine yep. whether it's family or not? Is it a month? Is it six months? At some point, you need to make the decision, this is family, I'm committing to this group of believers. Mm. And then after good. that point, you better have a pretty good reason as to why you're going to leave them. Love it. If, if hey, like like you say... Oh, boot, boot, boots dropping the hammer. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But, I'm with but like you say a lot, Lighthouse, we're not for everyone, and that's right. okay. You said it on the, on the beginning of this episode. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you just have license to, well, I don't know, for a year, three years, five years. Well, I'm not sure. Like, so, make the decision at some point. Amen. Give it some time, and then go somewhere else. If, uh, you, if you cannot confidently and discerningly make the decision... Lighthouse Church is my family. Please, there's a group of people that need your commitment. Couldn't agree more. They need it somewhere. Amen. So make the, find it. make the decision and then go from there. Uh, absolutely. And understand that there is a biblical mandate to do that. You know, as an apprentice and a follower of Jesus, we are called to commit ourselves to a local body, all gifts working together, all ligaments, strengthening one another, and to think that you can just bounce from here to there and never co fully commit to any one local assembly um, is altogether wrong. And it's not the design of Jesus. Caveat, let's just say that there are people who, who travel, you know, totally. may, maybe military or Amen. various things like that. I'm not, not coming after these people, but just to oh, say, certainly not. You, you can even head into that mindset with, hey, I'm here for a short period of time. This is right. going to be my, my family for the time being. But just so everyone knows, like, this is when I'm heading out. That's perfectly okay. We're talking more so about people who are local for an extended period of time. Absolutely. Which could easily segue into online church and... So, uh, you know, exclusively streaming services, yet never... Evan Conley has entered the <laughs> chat. <laughs> but I'm not going down that path right now. But what you just said actually is so congruent with what I asked you earlier. So prior to turning on the on switch to the record, I had asked you, Boots, if someone were to come to you and say, I want to leave my church, I want to leave this church, what would be the criteria that you would give them? Your response to me was, I would not give them a criteria. I would give them a question. And the question is, why do you want to leave the church? Which I think is brilliant and right on the money um, that would ultimately determine what's your motives? Mm -hmm. What are your motives to determine are they legitimate or are they just shallow and emotional? Mm -hmm. Are they in your feels because of something that you should work for or that you should address or that you can die to self and overcome? Or is it something that's more of a um a non-negotiable yeah th those closed-handed issues that you would then say well i i co-sign that mm -hmm. and, and i think and so for all intents and purposes what i want to do is i want to i, I want to start with if there is someone that would ever consider leaving a church i think the the, the baseline to begin with is what is the motive yeah. for leaving where's the this church? coming from absolutely then, then I think there are some things that should cause someone even that is not even considering leaving their church. These things should cause someone to question whether or not they should stay. Should I stay or should I go now? <laughs> hey, 
And so, so I, I, I've, I've written down several, and um, I want to see what you would think about those. Please. The first is all the more in 2024. This has become a real passion of mine. Um, and that is, I think somebody should consider leaving a church if said church abandons orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. That if it starts to deviate from the orthodox tenets of Christendom, of what we have, our founding fathers, patriarchs, but most importantly, the biblical clarity provided on certain biblical principles and truths, um, if a church begins to deviate from those, that should, that should be a major flag to go off, to go, wait a minute, is it safe here? Mm -hmm. Because And by founding fathers, you mean like church fathers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like the if, apostles. If you disagree <laughs> with Ben Franklin, <laughs> you're out of here. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm talking about the apostles. I'm talking about... Now we're I'm sitting here, and, and I realize you're trying to sell like a... a Patriot Bible or whatever. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, oh what? Where are we going, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's got the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've lost it. So okay, good. Come back, come back. So good. So, hey, so orthodoxy. Yep. Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so what that looks like is believing in the supremacy. Or for, let's start with the authority of Scripture, number one. Number one, because we're going to move from that. The authority of Scripture, the believer's call to repentance, the acknowledgement of the accomplished and atoning work of Jesus, the understanding that there is a triune Godhead. Um, what we would have is our statement of faith, um, that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun that there is a mandate on a believer to, once indwelt with the Holy Spirit, to be a witness for him. Um, it would be that we believe things like the orthodoxy would even get into, you know, biblical, a biblical sexual ethic, one man, one woman for one lifetime, a covenantal relationship, not a contractual one. Things like that, all of which we here at Lighthouse adhere to. Um, uh, baptism, the, those orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, if a church starts to sort of make it up as it goes along and starts to pick and choose and cherry pick as to what's culturally contextual and what's relevant and what we should adhere to based on somebody's opinion, um, man, that gets really, really dicey. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I think, I think I, I didn't bring our statement of faith with me, but I would say orthodoxy in the Apostles' Creed, the Westminster Confessional, um, the Nicene Creed, all of these rich writings that are derived, I mean, from Scripture. That's what I mean by way of orthodoxy. Yeah, and I, I would say it's incumbent upon the person church shopping or you know checking out different places figure out what these things are <laughs> figure out ahead of time yeah whether whether the church holds to those orthodox views so that you're not caught blindsided like well i thought you believed this well totally. no we never said that totally um because if you do know what are the close closed handed issues you're going to be able to spot the changes as that hand starts to open absolutely absolutely time. This is why when you go to a church, you want to ask them off the jump, not just whether or not you like the preaching or whether or not you like the environment or if your kids are well cared for. All of those things I understand are important. What you want to ask for is, can I see the statement of faith of the house? Mm -hmm. Can I see what you adhere to? Yeah. And make sure that those are orthodox, that they are rooted in a biblical in, in a biblical foundation. And we've had people come to starting point, which we've talked about before, which is yeah. kind of like this um, opportunity for newer people to come uh, after a service on a Sunday for us to hear about them, for them to hear about us, and for them to ask those kind of questions. Like, well, what do you believe about 
this. Totally. And get answers. Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things I, I really admire about certain people that we've talked about who have come and, and asked those potentially hard conversations. Absolutely. I would say number two, this is, this is, this is a, a present reality, but um, one that has surfaced most certainly starting in 2020. We started to see this a lot. We actually have done episodes on this, but that's when the church focuses more on politics than it does on Jesus. Now, I have, I have a, a caveat to that statement. Um, right now, it is very, people are very trigger happy when a church addresses something from the front and people don't like the church's view on it, stance on it, or their promotion of it. They'll go, why are you getting political? Mm-hmm. Okay. Here's, here has, I have crystallized my thought boots on this matter in that I don't believe that the church is to avoid politics. I believe in, in good taste and in good measure, politics should be engaged. And here's, here's how I want to define that. I believe that it's not so much that the church has gotten political. I believe that politics have gotten much more theological. Hmm. And so when legislature or Congress or the House or the president comes down on a matter that we have a theological basis for, this is the heart of God, this is what he says, this is what scripture illuminates, this is how we should walk, and they weigh into that, and then we have a retort for that, we're not getting political. They just got theological. And because it's seeped into culture, as a pastor, as leaders, as watchmen, as those that, that look out and see the sign of the times, we are called to address that so that it doesn't just bleed into and wash over those that are following Jesus. And then it gets too far down the road and they don't know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Nobody told us that abortion was wrong. Mm-hmm. Nobody told us about a biblical sexual ethic. Hold up. Nobody told me about uh, all of these things. I do, I do believe that some churches have gotten hyper-political, and it's wrong. And, and they beat the drum more for a candidate or how one should, should vote or, um, uh, you know, party lines are constantly being mentioned on and on and on. For me... I, I, I do not want to weigh into that. Why? Because I believe that I am called to proclaim the gospel, keep the focus upon Jesus, make sure scripture is being, you know, rightly divided. Um, but it's not always that. So when I make the statement that if a church becomes more focused on politics than Jesus, there's caveats to that. Mm-hmm. And the caveats aren't just because you don't like where a church is orthodox stands on a matter. That's not a church getting political. That's a church being sound theological. Mm-hmm. You, do you understand? You, you, I do. I do. I just. I think it's it's a really tough one to to define. Mm-hmm. Like, try me. <laughs> just like, where's the line? So, uh-huh. so you talked about you know, touting party lines, perhaps. Yeah. But advocating for policies that that party would advocate for that would be permissible or you know at at what point it's just it's just tough because so many people get it wrong yeah I think to get it right means that you don't shy away from the issue the issue being when it comes to standing in the gap for the innocent for holding to a biblical orthodox of sexuality I think when it comes to the matter of how, how to execute justice from a biblical framework, um, when it comes to, see, see, it is not political to address the, the, the matter of how we should care for our fellow man or even those that are foreigners. So, so naturally that's going to encroach the, the matter of, of borders or 
things like that. I think we should be addressing them, but being very careful that we don't then advocate a political party in so doing or beating the, the, the stump for any one person. I think there should be the education of, I, that's how I see Jesus doing it. Jesus neither railed against Rome, not, neither did he advocate for um, any other political movement. He taught people the message of the kingdom and then he entrusted that they would execute it rightly. Do you, do, does, that, does that bring any clarity to, or no? I'm like, no. No, it does. <laughs> it does. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Yeah, let, let's, let, let, let's, let's move on. <laughs> however, however, I do think people will recognize. I mean, we, we, we jumped into the deep end on yeah. that particular point. But people will recognize, wait, this is a very politically charged church. So it's kind of those you know it when you see it things. Yeah, it's it, and 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 it's very arguably I would hope that people would understand when I say it's it's stereotypical. Mhm. Mm yeah. No, I'm just I love I'm, this. <laughs> I lo I like I'm I, I like it. No, I I'm, I'm not disagreeing with with anything. Um I'm just picturing kind of what you said on the front end of it of like you hear something you don't like, and then people translate that as they're too political. Yes. So, like, let's say abortion, for example. You say something about protecting the unborn. Right. Oh, they're too political. Yeah. Wrong. No, we're not. Yeah. It's theological. Mm -hmm. That's the heart of God. That's yeah. a that's a that's a non-negotiable for me. I and and hear me. Understanding a church at the size of Lighthouse. I'm not going to preach that without grace. Yeah. That, hey, I understand that there's a many people in Lighthouse that have had an abortion. What I'm not willing to do is concede everything because I know that and say, I'm not going to take a stance on that issue because I'm afraid I might offend someone that either has or is considering. I, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. But what we will do is we will take a stand on it biblically but do so with grace to say, there's forgiveness, there's compassion, there's love from the Father that covers that. But yet, here is the line mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Understanding the same when it comes to a sexual ethic. Do you know how? Do you know how ridiculous for some to preach about abstaining from fornicating and premarital sex? in a hyper-sexualized culture like the one we live in and to actually stand firm on that, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to do it also understanding, hey, there's grace. There's love from the Father. There's compassion. There's second, third, fourth chances. But hey, here's the line on that. Same with homosexuality and the trans movement and, you know, gender and, you know, on and on and on. That's not political. That's theological. Yeah. And so people don't have the right to go, they're too political. No, 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 no. That, that's such an easy label. That's such conflated language now. Yep. Okay. I'm, hey, now I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Drug me into that? Yeah, I did. Okay. Number three. If transformation is absent, this is when I would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you see in this local assembly of believers that there's that there it, there's no life change? Like is this if, is this personal or collectively? That what well, this is both. It's a both end. Okay. It's a both end. Let's take personal first. Personal first is if there is not transformation, I'm going to largely put that on the person. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you growing? Why aren't you changing? See, it's easy. A lot of times when people have a, a stunted growth in their own personal walk, it's easy to blame the church for that. I'm not getting fed. Yeah, I'm not getting fed. Uh, I, I, you know, I need different preaching. I need, I need more verse by verse, line by line. I, they're not expository. They're topical here. Mm -hmm. um, all of all of this topical type. surface level, <laughs> yeah. right? 
all of this type of stuff. The scripture says each person must work out their salvation with fear and trembling. I, I don't get to blame my immaturity on anyone. Mm -hmm. Me and Jesus are the ones that walk in, in, in intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, this is why he's provided me his Holy Spirit so as to guide me into all truth, to counsel me, to lead me, to direct me, to convict me, to comfort me, but ultimately to grow me. So it's not the church, but when you look around the church and there is no collective transformation, meaning people aren't getting saved, there is no people, there isn't anybody new being baptized. There isn't people growing in greater understanding of scripture and even dying to self. There isn't, um, transformation should be visible in the body of Christ. And in a local assembly, I think that you should be able to look around and say, man, new people are being added. Um, people are, 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 are growing even by way of leadership. Um, those that used to teach small groups now are sitting under uh, others that they've raised up that are now teaching small groups. You should see transformation. Why? Because God is a God that transforms us and sanctifies us from the inside out. So that's evidence of health. That any, anything, you know, not everything that grows is healthy. There is growth in the darkness. Oh. That's toxicity. Come on, like somebody. a mushroom. But you should see transformation. Would you agree with that? I would, and I think making that distinction that it, it doesn't always have to be numerical growth. No, but like what you were saying, transformation, growth, uh, inwardly. Watching people grow in the fruits of the spirit. Watching yep. people grow in in ways that are evident and visible and things like that. Next one. You might want to consider bumping on down the road, if there is zero opportunity to serve. Mm -hmm. Meaning if the church, sort of going back to previous, there's no transformation, there's no change, there's no new blood. Um, it's, it's in that that the church sort of gets a little clicky, it gets exclusive, it gets ingrown, it gets um, where the same people that, you know, lead certain things, they're not looking for somebody to replace them. Mm -hmm. They're not bringing up younger, you know, leaders. They're, they're not giving opportunity for people to exercise their gifts. Um, if there is zero opportunity to serve, that means that many times the church has lost its mission mm -hmm. and it's lost really what it exists for. That's to reach the lost and to make disciples. And so if you can't serve, then I would question is, is it a place that's really raising up disciples yeah. and really investing in either the next generation or those that have, that have met Jesus? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the scripture tells the leaders of the church that we exist to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so where that is not happening, I would pull on that sweater string. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. And I would just add the caveat to that. You, you said rightfully so, there is zero opportunities to serve. Absolutely. The standard is not your preferred or ideal area to serve. So if, just because you can't get on the worship team <laughs> doesn't mean that you shouldn't serve elsewhere. There are opportunities. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, my, my, uh, my pastor, when I had gotten out of um, Teen Challenge, I came home and I had asked Pastor Jack Cox, what is it that I should do um, now that I've met Jesus? As I've said in previous episodes, my fear was I did not want to relapse. I didn't want to go backward. I wanted to progress. I said, what should I do? And he, without hesitation, said, you should say yes to every opportunity to serve. First, you're single. You're not married yet. You have nothing but time and you got a lot of margin you say yes to every ask. Um, and I, I just, I, he said, hey, if, you know, Jeff Tompkins, who, a uh, little shout out to Jeff Tompkins, come on now. He is the, the, the he oversees operations in the grounds of Severn Covenant Church. Um, you know, hey, there would be work parties and there would be times that, man, he, you know, I'd post up, he'd be like, scrub, scrub that bathroom, 
scrub it, toilets, urinals, replace the cakes, yeah. whole nine yeah. yards. That's, that's you. And I could just hear Pastor Jack ringing in my ear. Yeah. You say yes and yeah. do it heartily unto the Lord and watch what God does. And um, I, I just think, so, so it, it wasn't, hey, say yes to that which is congruent with your gift. They give you an opportunity to preach. Say yes to that, but no to everything else. Nope, that's not what he said. He said yes to everything. And that just, hey, that's the heart of Jesus. It was Jesus that got up, took his outer clothes, wrapped the towel around his base, waist, got down, washed feet as a demonstration, and then said, go and do likewise. Ultimately, what that was, was you serve the house. Mm -hmm. You serve the house and you serve those outside the house. But if there's zero opportunity, I think we clarified Sign that. of unhealth. Okay, yep. next one. Next one is you cannot submit to the leaders. Okay, if you're in a house where you feel like I can't receive from them, I don't respect them, and I do not... I cannot submit to them. The first question is, why? Why? Why is it? Is it? Is it? Well, you don't. You don't like their hair. Why? You don't. You don't like their 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 preaching style. You you don't. If it gets to, I feel like there's either duplicity, hypocrisy that their character is not above reproach in some regard. Well, okay. Well, then that, that's, that's legitimate and valid. Let's look into that. Let's consider. But um, if you cannot because you know something or, um, yeah, I, I, I want to be careful in this because, I, I'm, again, this I don't want to give license to preference, but I really want to spotlight character that if you cannot submit to them, well then, that would be a consideration of, hey, is this the house for me? Yeah, to me, it comes down to the idea of trust. Like, if, I, if I trust you, I can submit to you. Amen. I don't care what your preference is, I don't care what your skill set is, like, if I trust you, I'm gonna submit to you. And my thought is not only why, good question, but also when, so when did you start to Distrust yep. them. Good. If you didn't trust them to begin with, why did you commit to the house? Okay. So why and when did it happen? And then how did you engage with that reason for distrust That's right. or mistrust? Um, did you bring it to the proper channels? Did you bring it to them? Did you talk through it? Whatever. Um, so yeah, I would ask both of those clarifying questions. Those are great questions. Wonderful questions. Um, Here's another question for you. Hit What's me. the next one? This is last. This is the last one. And once again, this isn't comprehensive. Um, this is what... Um, Sorry, you, still, you like that, didn't still you? That. Still cracking up over that. that yeah. You really like that. Um, I would just have you know, um, I'm, still, I'm still fostering some broken ribs. Yeah. I'm I playing make, her. Didn't make you laugh as much this episode. So no. You're no, okay. Appreciate that. It was intentional. Last, this is sort of uh, this is this is sort of a near and dear to me as well. But I would say, I, I hate I hate that I keep saying hey, you might want to leave a church. That sounds so. Oh, I just I hate it for some reason. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to people leaving churches, um, I, I would just be very cautious of a church that promotes a celebrity culture. Um, I. In some ways, there's a degree of unavoidance. Is that a word back? Yep. That the, the bigger a church or what have you, um, the more possibility there may be to celebrate um, certain personalities or, or certain um, expressions and certain people. Um, but if the church itself or the leaders therein really rally to that and become accomplices to promote that, I would say that would that would that would sketch me out a little bit. Okay, so let's get right, let's get we, into uh, it. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, <laughs> we're a bigger church. Mm -hmm. um, you're pretty happening guy. 
there's a lot of people here, obviously, who, who look up to you, um, rightfully so, I think. But how, how, have, how have we taken steps to avoid that celebrity mentality here? Um, yeah. At some point, there's, it's not all on the church to do it. It's also the responsibility of the individual. Don't put someone on a pedestal, all that kind of stuff. Well said. But what, what measures have we taken yep. to do that? Wonderful, wonderful question. Number one, um, number one, I am surrounded with leaders. Those specifically would be the elders that are not yes men. Neither do they um, do they drink my Kool Aid, if you will. Um, meaning, they are are not impressed by me. They many of which um, have been with us from the beginning of Lighthouse. They've seen me grow up. Mm. So they do not, um, they see and are grateful for um, God's work in me, uh, not just through me, but in me. Mm. And they watch that closely. There's a high level of accountability for what I do and how I do it. Um, but there is but one hero around that elder table and his name is Jesus and we never get that confused. And so that creates the sort of the law of the lid. Number two, um, does that make sense? Yep. Number two, I have worked hard from Jump Street. There was a time where Lighthouse was growing where I got concerned that Lighthouse may become um, a, a bit of a personality cult. Uh, personality where there was a single expression and it was oriented around one person and that that person you know in our formative years would have been me so what I've done is I've really made sure that we're a multi-expression church and specifically from the pulpit mm. so man just watching John grow in seasons past, other leaders that we would promote to preach from the pulpit, to share their expression, to really exercise their gifting. So there wasn't one focal point, one focal person. That's another, another measure. The staff, we do not foster a culture of honor around here, meaning that there's no, I, I know I'm the lead pastor, but there's no supreme leader if you will. So we are all in this together, co-laborers, um, honoring one another, but no one more than another. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I have been very um, intentional about that. Yeah. And so where there are not measures to, to protect from this celebrity status within the staff or the, or the, the leaders of a church, and yet they promote someone with this absorbent amount of honor, recognition, spotlight, what have you. This is from everything from the way people talk to what's posted on social media to the way um, people grandstand a personality. All of that stuff, um, if that is happening in a church, that would, that would cause me major concern. Yeah. Because because naturally that comes at the expense of honoring, glorifying and worshiping Jesus. Yeah. And a church should never be a place that cultivates a rival. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's that is bad mojo. And some leaders will use church platform for that end. Yeah. So, a church should be on guard of that and the leaders therein should hold people accountable to that. We've got into it, Boots. We, we did. And, I'm, and everything that I'm saying, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Did I, did, did, did I put a period there? Is that clear? Back, hold us accountable over here. We're talking about a lot <laughs> of heavy today. revvies. Yeah. <laughs> we went everywhere today. Yeah, we did. It's true. I would, I would only add to that last one, and this is something that you, you have mentioned before and you demonstrate it. Um, you don't make yourself the hero. Mm. Like when you're preaching or teaching, you give an example of something. I remember that that was one of the things that you've said like before to people on staff. Don't make yourself the hero. Amen. Don't tell a story of when you 
you know, you crushed it. You got it right. Right. Um, I think all of that contributes to, nope, we're all in this together. We all, we're all um, looking to the one hero. We're just echoes of him. Amen. Amen. And you know who was the greatest example of that as, as a follower of Jesus was the Apostle Paul. Uh, there's one story my father always used to tell me and remind me of. Um, it was the Apostle Paul. He went into um, Lystra and Derby. This is in the book of Acts. God is moving miraculously through Paul. Well, he gets there and the people of said township r- recognized him and thought him to be a god. They said, oh, you're, I believe Paul was with Silas. I thought it was Barnabas, but. Could have been. Could have been, Pastor. Fact check. Fact check that. Lystra Derby. So he gets there and they regarded him as Zeus. Mm -hmm. And they, and they, they, and his counterpart, they thought he was a god as well. And Paul, I love this. It says that he tore his shirt open (laughs) to show them his humanity. Wow. And my father always used to say, you know, I can't, I can't imagine, you know, he tore his shirt open. There's his bird chest with all that probably black Middle Eastern hair. <laughs> and he said, and he said, men, men, I'm of like manner. I'm just a man. And we're following the God man. But I am with, I'm with you. And it says that they stoned him. They stoned him. Why? Because they, they, they wanted a God. Yep. You know, and St. Augustine used to say, whatever you idolize, you'll eventually demonize. Mm. So my old man always used to say, so don't set yourself up because it's only a setup for a fall. Don't do that. So he would say, constantly tear your shirt. Show your humanity. Show your, that, hey, you're working this out with fear and trembling just like your fellow pilgrim. Mm-hmm. Do not... Do not think more highly of yourself than you are. And man, that my father modeled that, but but we took our cues from the Apostle Paul himself. Can you even imagine being so? In maybe that next six- Sunday I'll just rip my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at how muscular I am. Um, it was Barnabas, by the way. It was. You know what? Game one. Barnabas is my guy. I gotta. I gotta <laughs> shout out to old Barney. <laughs> yeah, which means son of encouragement. Ooh, it was a nickname, folks. Come on. Look it up. Um, yeah, I remember one time, I know we're getting ready to land this plane, but <laughs> one time you said something along the lines of, when you're speaking, people look up to you for your strengths, but they resonate with you in your weaknesses. Amen. Um, and I feel like that's that's what Paul was trying to do. Like, look, I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm a human just like you. Totally. Wop! And they got him for it. Yep. So... <laughs> Needless they got to say. him for it. <laughs> Amen. Tear I'll be shirt. the first one to knock you off your horse if you get up there. <laughs> oh, 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 back. What? She like deputy dog. <laughs> <laughs> what you doing up there? Yeah. Why'd you say that? Oh, she don't let me get away with anything. Nope. But that'll. Oh, back, I'll preach. And oh, back when I get down, she'll go. You got work to do. <laughs> God love her. You got work to do. <laughs> yeah, just like a sister. She yeah. won't. Mm-mm. You gotta oh, take that God. back in the lab. Yeah, <laughs> ain't gonna cut it. <laughs> We're gonna have love to go you. with neck service. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be the one online. I need you to do better. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, all righty, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining us for another season of Simplexity. Yes. Number seven, just around the bend. Ooh. Gonna take a. Oh, we got we got a lot planned, don't we, buddy? We do. Got some heavy hitters. It's a sh- it's a it's a wonder we have. I almost said it's a shame. It's a wonder we haven't run out of topics at this point. I know. But man, we just we just we, keep on getting. We got a we got a backfill of them, <laughs> uh, but still continue to send those topic suggestions in. We do appreciate those. And listen, listen. <laughs> this is a wonderful time to like and subscribe that's true (laughs) smash the subscribe button daggone it yeah and send me some cash oh my (laughs) god no just joking hey duncan we're looking for a sponsor (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're celebrities i know we're trying yeah we don't foster a celebrity (laughs) culture at the church but here in simplexity we welcome it (laughs) right yeah but no we do appreciate all you guys all the love and support 
and we'll see you next season. Love you guys. Oh,